on September 10, 1954, the Great Lakes Fishery Treaty was signed after years of debate between officials from the United States and Canada in an attempt to solve the issues of decreasing fish populations in the Great Lakes. This treaty led to shared management between the United States and Canada, an increased population of native fish species, and a decrease of the invasive sea lion pay. The U.S. and Canada have maintained this diplomatic relationship to the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. In the 1600s, 20 recorded indigenous nations lived around the Great Lakes as they had for millennia, managing and utilizing the aquatic ecosystem. Beginning in the 16th century, French and British fur traders moved into the area to trap and trade the numerous beaver and fur-bearing mammals. Fishing was also popular, and commercial fishing became a regular part of international trade in the 17th century. By the 19th century, the lands north of the Great Lakes were British Canadian and the lands south belonged to the United States. Both nations built canals such as the Erie, Welland, and St. Lawrence Seaway. These canals removed natural barriers to the ocean, allowing sea lamprey, a deadly invasive blood-sucking fish resembling an eel, into the Great Lakes. At the time, fish populations in the Great Lakes ecosystem were at historically high levels. Edward Gullett reported in his book, Early Life in Upper Canada, catches of 90,000 whitefish per day and lake trout were also being harvested at record numbers. In 1897, representatives from the United States and Canada met for the first convention on the Great Lakes. This diplomacy, similar to Tisaiswa Treaty, failed because of a lack of urgency dealing with sea lamprey, and many saw this as a time of limitless fish populations in the Great Lakes. This would have severe consequences. A second attempt at diplomacy was held in 1946. But U.S. and Canadian officials failed to reach an agreement. An ever-increasing population of sea lamprey caused the extinction of native species like the blue pike. The record harvests of lake trout dwindled in all Great Lakes, except for an extremely minute population in Lake Superior. When the population of one species dropped, commercial fishing targeted another species, bringing the populations of all native fish species to near zero. For example, in the Detroit River, whitefish were driven into pens by the hundreds of thousands to be dried and used as fertilizer. An increase in industrial pollution from growing cities and shipping put additional strain on the Great Lakes ecosystem. Newspaper headlines around the Great Lakes penned most of the blame on the sea lamprey. In recent years, however, a catastrophe has been visited upon these fisheries by the invasion of a voracious marine predator. Commercial catches diminished as this parasite multiplied in unbelievable numbers. And then, tragically and abruptly, the lake trout fisheries of Lakes Huron and Michigan collapsed completely as the fish all but disappeared from the fishermen's nets. The essence of the treaty when both countries said, okay, unless we finally do get together and form a collaborative that has the strength of an international treaty around it, we're not going to recover the fisheries of the Great Lakes. Both nations agreed that commercial fishing and pollution were to blame for the decline, but debate on these issues were too contentious for a successful treaty. Rather than have another failed treaty discussion about the diplomatic solution, they focused on the one thing that they could agree upon, that the sea lamprey was the problem. As the treaty states in Article 1, the purpose of this convention is to eradicate or minimize the populations of sea lamprey in the Great Lakes ecosystem. In Article 2, the treaty requires the formation of an international joint commission, today known as the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, to oversee research, continue the discussion of regulations, and establish the agreement that both parties weren't allowed to import or enforce laws that contradict what both sides agreed upon. That treaty assigns the authority to the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission to control sea lamprey in both the U.S. and Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. That means if that if there was a party, um, like an, a, a state agency or whatever, that said, no, we're not letting you in here to do control, the commission could bring forward the treaty and say, we have the international authority to do this. Step aside, we're coming in and doing control. Now, we don't like to operate that way, so we use diplomacy and we sit down with the states and 
you know, and work it out to figure out what the differences are. You know, it's it's there's complexities to the control program, even though the even though the lamprecide that's used to kill the larval lamprey is very specific, you can get non-target mortality if you're not careful with things like sturgeon or whatever, or if there's endangered species. So there are tension points that flare up, but we have to sit down and work it out. Both the U.S. and Canadian legislative bodies ratified that treaty. In an interview with Bill Matz from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, the involvement of Indigenous nations has changed over time, he said. Since 1986, Indigenous nations on the U.S. side are represented through intertribal groups on the committees of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. This occurred after the U.S. tribes petitioned to be involved. There is still a long way to go to full representation of both the U.S. and Ontario sides of the border. There was still an ongoing effort to create a chemical that could kill sea lamprey efficiently while not harming native species. This miracle chemical was discovered on August 21st, 1956, when scientists at Hammond Bay Biological Station Laboratory in Michigan created a chemical that chemically killed lampreys in a jar but left several species of fish in that same jar unharmed. This was the 5,209th chemical compound to be tested, but the first to be as successful as the standards required for a lampreyside. That research was funded by the U.S. and Canada and overseen by commissioners of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Almost three-fourths of the commission's budget is dedicated to sea lamprey eradication. Application of lampreyside was the next step taken by the commission and required diplomacy with the various state, provincial, and tribal government agencies. The sea lamprey is the only invasive species in the Great Lakes. In the 1990s and 1980s, several more invasive species arrived, including the zebra and quagga mussel, now numbering over a quadrillion in the Great Lakes ecosystem. The mussels most likely arrived here in the ballast waters of Sipsh from the Black Sea. Certainly, uh, the treaty of the 1950s did not anticipate the wave of invasive species that came into the Great Lakes uh, through the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. The treaty and the commission have ensured that the U.S. and Canada successfully continue to manage the Great Lakes in a diplomatic way that benefits both nations. So it's a hugely successful program. That's not to say it's not without vulnerabilities, because it certainly is. These lamprey could start developing resistance to the pesticides. There's um, a lot of lamprey that are never spawned because of because of dams. To keep up to date with changes in the Great Lakes ecosystem, ongoing diplomatic developments between national, state, and tribal governments, the Commission meets annually to debate and discuss solutions to ever-adapting issues. The authority of the treaty gives the Commission the power to continue effectively managing the Great Lakes. The lamprey control, it is now... It is now an example of a very rare example where we've actually been able to technically control an invasive species. Mm -hmm. You don't see that very often. Um, are they problematic? They still are problematic. The ultimate goal is eradication. And whether we get to eradication or not remains to be seen. But we do have the technology right now through specific lamprocytes to bring them down to a level low enough where we can now recover our native species. If we cannot keep pace through adequate control and development of new techniques, the successes of the past decades will deteriorate. The fishery enjoyed by five million people will be lost, as will both the public and private investments. Protecting the fishery and the Great Lakes ecosystem requires the cooperation of all who enjoy this marvelous resource. The Great Lakes Fishery Treaty of 1954 was absolutely essential to preserving the well-being of the Great Lakes. It came about because both countries put aside the points they were debating and diplomatically agreed to a common problem, eradication of the sea lamprey. The treaty created the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, that continues to monitor newer threats to the Great Lakes alongside with states, provinces, and indigenous nations around the Great Lakes by meeting annually to discuss, debate, and diplomatically problem solve the Great Lakes fisheries I and millions of others enjoy remains well managed.